We are uh, continuing today, actually we're concluding our series called the Why Me series. Uh, we're looking over these past uh, several weeks at the life of Joseph, and we're just learning some lessons from his life. And so what I want to talk to you about today is responding to adversity. Last year, my oldest daughter, Sarah, she graduated from college, and we had a nice ceremony together. She, uh, uh, the ceremony was in Queens, uh, in the city, and after the ceremony, uh, we were driving back, me and my wife and our other three daughter and our other three kids, and uh, we also had my in-laws in the car. And so we were driving on the Whitestone Express, we were heading to the Whitestone Bridge, and I had just started to pull into, I was pulling into the right-hand lane, and just as I got into the right-hand lane, I noticed in my rearview mirror somebody speeding, probably doing over 100 miles an hour, and I thought to myself, either he's going to hit me or he's going to pass me. Well, he passed me, but he reacted by going all road rage on me, and before I knew it, he was slowing up in front of me. I was trying to get around him, and after uh, like another 10 seconds or so, there I am in the middle of the Whitestone Expressway at a dead stop with this guy in front of me, with my in-laws and with my, the rest of my family in the car. Now, he thought by reacting the way he did that I was cutting him off, right? He reacted in a way that uh, was, it didn't fit what my intentions were, right? And you know, I think we can all say that at some point we've been guilty of road rage. Right? <laughs> Who wants to have a moment of confession here in church today, right? And, and the reason I share that story is because I want you to know that reacting um, impulsively often leads to reflecting circumstances that we're in rather than rising above them. When we're treated rudely, we can be rude back. When we're Tr treated unfairly, we can seek to take revenge. When we're mistreated, we can react impulsively by getting angry and bitter. Let me give you one example of someone who didn't react impulsively, who responded to opposition, great opposition, with grace and forgiveness. His name was Nelson Mandela. Uh, as, as you know, Nelson Mandela was a great advocate to end apartheid in South Africa, but as he was fighting against apartheid, one of the things that happened to him was that he suffered in prison for 27 years. That's a long time. Eventually, when he got out, he was an instrument of change in that country, eventually bringing about um, the end to apartheid, um, changing the Constitution. He became president in a truly representative, representative democracy. And, um, and so, you know, one of the reasons that we respect the people that we respect the most is their response to adversity, isn't it? The people that we respect the most are generally people who've walked through a fire or two, maybe through the valley of the shadow of death like Nelson Mandela. We respect people who've been hurt but don't hurt back, who are treated unjustly or unfairly but who don't strike back, who are, who are, who we, re we respect people who faced extraordinary health challenges but don't lose their love of life. They didn't despair. And so it's an ability that I believe that we all have. And when exercised, it actually keeps us from becoming like our enemies. It keeps us from reflecting our circumstances. It defeats evil. And this ability allows us to bring good from our suffering. Listen, when we react, we actually relinquish control of our lives. But a measured response, a measured thought through response ensures that that doesn't happen. We have the capacity, all of us, to choose our responses to life's challenges rather than simply react to them. But the challenge is, right, the best and most positive response isn't easy. The response that has the potential to reverse the natural course of things isn't natural. In other words, the response that's best for us is the least intuitive response. The response that makes the most difference in a positive direction is the response that we are least likely to choose. And most often, we're tempted to miss it. So today, I want to help you see how God's presence can help you respond rather than react impulsively to adversity in your life. And that's what we're going to see in the life of Joseph as we continue with 
his story. Now, we've been in this series for the past six weeks. We're looking at the life of Joseph, and it's this story of this young man, and I think better than any other story that I've ever read about, illustrates the power of a measured response. And like me and like you, Joseph didn't know the end of his story, and sometimes he didn't even know he would have a story to share. Um, but throughout the story and throughout the circumstances that he faced, he chose a certain way to respond rather than react impulsively. He chose the unusual response, the unexpected response. And so let's, uh, let me catch everybody up to um, where we're at in the story. Um, so Joseph's story is recorded in the book of Genesis in the Bible. Uh, a lot of chapters are devoted to the life of, of Joseph. He was sold into slavery by his brothers early on as a teenager at 17 years old, and he ends up in Egypt. And even though he experiences um, success, he also experiences great adversity and injustices. So after interpreting a dream for Pharaoh, he ends up becoming second in command in Egypt and saving Egypt and the surrounding nations from a severe famine that was facing the whole entire region. And eventually, he has this emotional reunion with his brothers. We talked about that last week. He, he puts them through a series of tests initially, and then he finally reveals to his brothers who he is, and he forgives them. So today, we're going to conclude our story by looking at Genesis chapter 50. We're going to pick up the story at the point where Joseph's father um, has just passed, um, and uh, the, for the funeral, Pharaoh shows up. It's a, it's a big funeral. It's a big deal, actually, in Egypt. Um, Pharaoh shows up. Other dignitaries show up to Jacob's funeral, the father of Joseph. And, um, and, and the whole nation is actually mourning the loss of Joseph's uh, father. So uh, the brothers at this point, after their dad has died, are thinking to themselves, oh, no. J Dad's dead. Dad's past, is Joseph going to get revenge for what we did to him all those years before? So they're afraid. And so they're thinking, okay, how can we make sure that Joseph doesn't give, give us back what we deserve, right? He doesn't uh, take revenge. And so they come up with this story. They actually fabricate a story, and they go to Joseph, and they tell him, hey, Dad wanted to leave one last message to you uh, before he died, Forgive your bros, okay? <laughs> Forgive your bros. So this is Joseph's response. They're, they're um, in his throne room. Uh, they're, they're basically like falling down on their knees before him. It says in verse, we're going to look at chapter 50, verses 18 to 21. It says, his brothers came and threw themselves down before him. We are slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Most people, based on what happened to Joseph, would expect him to respond a certain way, right? Um, but Joseph defies expectation. He defies his instinct, and he even defies his emotions by responding rather than reacting impulsively. You know, 10% of life is what happens to you. The other 90% is how you respond to it. 10% of life is what happens to you. 90% is how you respond to it. When we choose to respond rather than react, we'll have a perspective that allows us to move successfully into the future, to create a positive future out of a bad experience. And Joseph was able to do this, to respond like this because he knew, listen, he knew God was with him. And that's the key here. If you remember, at, in a lot of different places, all through these chapters that focus on the life of Joseph, we see God saying that he was with Joseph, right? It says God was with him at different points. And that's a very important thing to remember. So let me ask you, how would somebody in your circumstances respond if they were absolutely confident that God was with them? How would they respond? You know how normally people would respond. What's expected in your circumstances? But how would somebody in your circumstances respond if they were confident Absolutely confident that God was with him. Well, let's look at how Joseph responded. Instead of retaliating, Joseph demonstrates remarkable maturity and grace. 
So let's talk about his response. There's three things I want to point out today as we look at how Joseph responded to adversity. First, uh, Joseph remembers his place. Second, he remembers the, uh, the bigger picture. And then he remembers his purpose, okay? He remembers his place, he remembers the bigger picture, and he remembers his purpose. So in verse 19, Joseph remembers his place. I want you to notice that in this verse, Joseph is remembering his place. It says, Joseph says to his brothers, don't be afraid, am I in the place of God? So Joseph says, I may be second in command, but I'm not God. I'm a servant of God too. Um, Wanting, listen, wanting to take the place of God is actually something that's very much a part of our human condition, isn't it? and something that has existed from the beginning. If you remember in the beginning of time when uh, Adam and Eve were in the garden, we see the serpent coming to Adam and Eve, and what does he say? Did God really tell you to eat of the tree of good and evil? In other words, don't you want to be in the place of God? Don't you want to take his place? Don't you want to be the king and queen of your own life? Genesis began with Adam and Eve trying to become like God as they ate of the tree. Genesis ends 50 chapters later with Joseph saying, am I not in the place of God? I'm actually his servant. In other words, Joseph knew his place. He knew that he lived under the law and he lived his life for the glory of God. Joseph remembers his place. Tim Keller says the fastest way to become like Satan is to try to be God to be your own king and arbiter of truth. In other words, we want to be our own God. We want to be large and in charge, right? But what Genesis says is that um, we are not the one, ones that call all the shots, right? We're not the ones that are in control. I was um, at, talking to a friend recently, and he shared about a baseball game that he went to to watch his, his, that his son was playing in. And When he was at the baseball game, there were parents right next to him shouting at the umpire because they were upset with the calls that the umpire was making. What's interesting about that, and by the way, I hope you're not those parents at the ball game, okay, with your redemption (laughs) t-shirt. What's interesting about those parents is they weren't in charge, were they? The umpire was the one in charge. He was the one calling the shots. Listen, Joseph knew his place. Do you know your place? Say, Pastor Dave, I don't ever try to be like God. I don't try to take God's place. Let me ask you, how about at work? How do you speak to other people about your colleagues? Do you gossip about them when they're not around, or do you speak well of them? How about when you're seeking that promotion? Do you neglect your spiritual life and your family and your health so that you can do all that you can to get that promotion? Do you know your place? How about your time? Who's in charge? You might say, what I do with my free time is my decision. If I want to doom scroll on my social media feed rather than reading the Bible, that's my decision. Do you know your place? What about your partner? Are you always telling them what to do? Are you trying to change them? Are you in the place of God? Joseph shows us real transformation, friends, where you and I might react to our brothers by getting angry and seeking revenge, Joseph, as powerful as he was, as gifted as he was, as rich as he was, responds by saying, am I in the place of God? By asking this question, it's of course implied that he's not. He's God's servant, and that's going to lead us to our second point today, that Joseph remembers the big picture. He remembers the big picture. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is he remembers his theology. What is theology? It's basically just what you believe about God. And so this is what I mean. Joseph has suffered a lot in life. He's been betrayed. He's been ridiculed. He's been hurt by his dad, his brothers. He's been falsely accused of sexual harassment. He's been forgotten by the cupbearer in prison who he served time with. He was falsely put in jail twice. He suffered a lot of heartache. Joseph suffered a lot. And one of the questions that comes to mind for me is how can a human being go through all this suffering and still get through life, still respond the way he does? Where does he get the resources? It's because he remembered the big picture. It's because he believed that God was real and he was confident that God was with him. All throughout the chapters on Joseph, we see God mentioning that time and time again, that he was with him. Back in, the, in fifth grade, we had this uh, fire prevention awareness day. 
I, I don't know if you've ever had this in your elementary school, but every year we'd have one day where the fire trucks would come to our school and park in the parking lot. The kids would get to like sit in the trucks and um, you know talk to the firemen and look at the trucks and. Um, for this particular fire safety day, one of the things that they did were exercises uh, around the school. And they picked two of the fifth graders to be a part of these exercises. And uh, one of the kids got to go and hide inside the building, and the firemen were going to try to find him, right? Kind of like a mock, hey, there's a fire and somebody's stuck in the building type of thing. The other exercise was to rescue somebody from the roof. That was me, all right? <laughs> so they asked me to climb up the ladder of the truck to get on the roof, and I was a little nervous about it, right? I, I mean, it's a big ladder. You're going to the third, like, like three floors. And as I, I remember, as I was climbing up the ladder, um, my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Schantz, was over by the, in the front of the school watching with the rest of the fifth graders. And I remember looking over at Mr. Schantz, and you got you to understand, Mr. Schantz was a guy's guy. He was really cool. Um, all the fifth grader guys, wanted, boys wanted to be like him, you know. Uh, he was a really great teacher. He was a football coach, head football coach for the boys' high school soccer team. And uh, anyway, so I look over at Mr. Schantz, and just in that moment, he, he, he smiles and he gives me one of these head nods, like, you can do it. And I remember just the fact that he did that, that he was present, that I knew he was there, gave me the courage to go up the ladder and then eventually, like, you know, they rescued me. They, they tied a rope around me and lowered me to, to the ground. And, uh, um, and, you know, some of you, listen, some of you aren't able to respond like God wants you to respond to adversity in life because you don't really believe that God is present with you. You don't believe, like we just heard with Mr. Schantz, that God is, the, is there, he's nodding, he's there for you, he's with you in the midst of the adversity that you face. And I want you to see that today. Do you see that God is there in your adversity? Friends, God is there, he's not distant, you're not alone. There's a Latin term for this, and it's this idea of quorum Deo, and it means that we live our lives in the presence of God. To live quorum Deo is to live one's life in the presence of God, under his authority, to the glory of God. R.C. Sproul says to live, as, uh, to live all of life quorum Deo is to live a life of integrity. Because Joseph saw the big picture, because he was confident that God was present, Joseph was able to resist temptation, to endure hardship, to keep his spirits up even when people let him down, and this allowed him to take his tears, right, and silence them. It allowed him in that moment not to take revenge on his brothers, but to be compassionate. So let's go back to the passage again and see how Joseph continues to respond to his brothers in verse 20. Joseph says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. After suffering for decades because of his brothers, uh, the reason I got through life is because, this is what Joseph is saying, I understood the big picture. God was always there. He was present. Even when you guys meant it for evil, God meant it for good. Joseph remembers the big picture. What was meant for evil, God meant for good. Now, some of you might wonder, if there's evil in the world, how can God exist? If God exists, why would he allow suffering? Now, I'm going to ask you to think a little bit this morning. Did you have enough coffee? All right, we're going to think about the, this question a little bit. I want you to stick with me. I want to try to answer it by talking about love. If love is a choice, suffering is a possibility. If it's possible to love, it's also possible to hurt. The only way that love is possible is if you have a choice to choose love. The theological term here is free will. What's free will? It's the ability to choose. In other words, if you have the ability to choose love, you also have the ability to choose hate. If you have the ability to choose what's right, you also have the ability to choose what's wrong. So that's what makes suffering possible. So why did God give us free will? Because this is the only way that love is possible. If he didn't give us the ability to choose, then we couldn't have the ability to choose him. So why did God do this? Because he didn't want a robot. He loves us, and he wants us to love him back for who he is, right? And in order for us to love, we have to be able to choose love. So the challenge is this. In order for us to choose love, we also have to have the freedom to choose evil. And when we choose evil, we choose what the Bible calls sin. And what does sin do? Unfortunately, it leads to pain and suffering. 
And so for God to remove evil and suffering, either he has to remove our freedom to choose or he has to remove us. Now, the question that most people don't ask, but people should ask, is this question. If there's no God, then who decides if there is evil? I'll give you an example. How many of you have a brother or sister? Oh, okay, that's not that many. <laughs> okay, I'm asking for a little bit more response. How, how many of you uh, love your brother and sister? Oh, okay, all right. How many of you have ever fought with your brother or sister? Okay, yeah. In my household, I usually fought with my older brother, and I remember times when I would fight with my older brother, but then I would like rush to tell mom and dad what he did to me. Hey, mom and dad, my brother was mean to me. Hey, mom and dad, he did this. Hey, mom and dad, he hurt me. And, you know, I remember these, these fights that happened, and um, now here's my question. What if there were no parents? What if there were no rules in the house? Uh, who would say what is right or wrong? In other words, there has to be a standard, right? If there's no God, then there's no moral point of reference. If there's no God, then who determines what good and evil is? So if we're honest and we have integrity as we look at this question today, we can't use the presence of evil and suffering as proof that God doesn't exist. In reality, the fact that we do believe in evil and suffering is more proof that he does exist. Some people say that suffering is proof that God doesn't love you. I say that we need to understand, what we need to understand is that suffering is an evidence of the lack of love. And here, here are some examples to, to share with you that, that show that. We, we see it every day. My chiropractor, Steve, he makes adjustments on my back and my neck. Why does he do that? Well, he does that. Do you think he does that to hurt me? Maybe. <laughs> but... but but he, he primarily does that to uh, lead to something better, right? So I'm free of pain. I, I feel better physically. Um, if you ever go to a counselor, why does the counselor take you back to those painful points in your past, maybe to your childhood? Because the counselor has a vision for something better, right? To, to be free of the past, to be free of the pain, to move forward into your future in freedom and forgiveness. The presence of suffering isn't a lack of love. In fact, a lot of times the presence of suffering is proof of the presence of love. So your ability to respond in a God-honoring way to adversity rather than react impulsively depends on you remembering your place, remembering the big picture, and lastly, remembering your purpose. Listen, the Bible says that we are to love God and love others. In verse 20 of chapter 50, Joseph says that the evil that his brother showed him was meant for good. What was the good? The saving of many lives. Let me tell you a story of Inky Johnson, and then I'm going to show you a short video clip of Inky Johnson. He played college football for the University of Tennessee. He was a standout corner, projected to be in the top 30 pick of the draft, and then he had a devastating injury that left his right arm and hand paralyzed. And so we're going to look, check out a video uh, here where he discovered through that hardship and adversity his purpose in life. Let's check it out. And people even know me ask me all the time, Inky, why wouldn't you change what happened to you? You got a paralyzed right arm and hand. I'm like, if you only knew and if you only saw the works that God has done in people's lives around me, what he's done in me, yeah, it's great, it's cool. But what God has done in the people's lives around me, like you can't put a price on that. Amen. Like at a certain point, like what is it really about? Like, and I know the initial reaction when we go through things is to say, man, why did this have to happen to me? And this is an honest reaction. Because sometimes good people go through some crazy stuff. And some of the things we go through, I'm going to just be real, it's not, a, it's not a scripture for it. It's not. You can't go, hey, go to Romans 2-2. They're like, what? It's not. But this is what I've understood. In life, some people don't need you to preach a sermon. They need you to live one. And so when they see you living it, they can connect and identify with that. The only thing I ask of you, as talented, as brilliant, as powerful, as beautiful as you are, never allow life to make you forget why you started in the first place. Can you imagine? Can you imagine him being in his, his position? All of his dreams, all of his hopes were based on being a professional football player. 
And in an instant, it came all crashing down. Listen, God can take your greatest adversity, recycle it, and make it into your greatest ministry. We live in a me-centered society, a selfish, selfie generation. TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. There's nothing wrong with these things, but it can easily stir up this natural tendency in our hearts to be me-centered. Joseph says that the purpose of our lives is to serve others. Good here is defined as essentially what helps other people. And that's what, how Joseph understands his purpose of life. He says, I'm here ultimately to help people. And in verse 21, he says, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. He's talking to his brothers. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. He says that 40 years ago, you put your kid brother in a pit. I was the kid you resented all your life. Me, I was the guy you wanted to get rid of, left for dead. The same guy now will provide for you. He's serving his brothers. See, what Joseph is saying is, look, what you did was wrong. He's talking to his brothers. But if you wouldn't have done that, then I wouldn't have been sold to the Midianites. And if I wasn't sold to the Midianites, then I wouldn't have gone down to Egypt. If I didn't go down to Egypt, then I wouldn't have served in Potiphar's house. If I wouldn't have been in Potiphar's house, I would be, wouldn't have been falsely accused by his wife of something I never did. And if I w- never was falsely accused of something I never did, I wouldn't have gone to jail. And if I wouldn't have gone to jail, I would have never met these two guys who had dreams. And if, I, if that wouldn't have happened, I never would have been in Pharaoh's house to interpret his dream. And if that wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't have been in charge of all of Egypt. But I am because God took all of those events and wove them together. And now, brothers, I'm here to help you to provide for your future. How's that for gracious love and forgiveness of our Heavenly Father? Through the adversity, Joseph was confident God was with him, and it shaped his character. He was able to serve others. He didn't react impulsively and throw them into prison for years, like maybe uh, he he might have if he didn't remember that God was with him. He didn't hold on to bitterness for years. He responded not out of his pain, but out of forgiveness. And so what Joseph shows us is that because he was confident that God was present, it transformed him. And because of this, he was able to save his family. He was able to save the nation of Israel by moving his family to Egypt. Maybe 70 people were in his family. He moved them to Egypt. And over the period of 400 years, the nation grew to over 2 million people. God, through Joseph and the adversity that he faced, used that to create a nation, a nation that he had promised to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I will make you into a great nation that number like the stars in the sky. My purpose, says Joseph to his brothers, is to provide for you and your children. My purpose in life is to live it to serve others. And all that to say that God will use your adversity. God will use your adversity in life so that you can help somebody else. You know, we tend to see our suffering as a waste. Why did that have to happen to me? Why did I have to go through that? Oh man, I wish I could never have to relive, never have had to live through that. But listen, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is, he says, God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can what? Comfort others. When others are troubled, we are able to give them the same comfort that God gave us. So when we are weighed down with troubles, it's for your benefit and your salvation. You know what? Let's commit to God today that we're not going to waste the adversity in our lives. We're going to use it to help others. I, I, um, a number of years ago, moved, uh, my, me and my family to California for a job, and the job didn't work out, unfortunately. And it was hard. I didn't have another job to go to. We had to move back east and live with a relative until I was able to find another job. The disappointment, the guilt I felt, uh, the adversity I felt, having to not just find another job, but having to move across the country and Uh, deal with all of that in the months that it took to find another job. But you know what? This past year, I began to realize how God has has used that adversity for me to help others. There's a brother in this church, part of my life group, um, lost his job. I was able to come alongside of him, encourage him, pray for him, support him, sometimes give some financial, uh, financial support. Listen, don't let Don't waste adversity in your life. Use it 
to serve others. Remember your place, remember the big picture, and remember your purpose. You know, Joseph is a good example for us, but he's not the ultimate example. He points to a, a better Joseph. He points to Jesus. In the Gospel of John chapter 1, we see that Jesus went to his own, but his own didn't receive him. Jesus was rejected by his family. Joseph was rejected by his family. Jesus was betrayed, betrayed by Judas. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. Jesus was arrested, even though he wasn't guilty of anything, just like Joseph was thrown into prison, even though he wasn't guilty of anything. Jesus went to the cross and suffered so that he could save many. Joseph went and suffered so that he could save many. But listen, Jesus didn't just save a nation. He saved the world. He was raised to the right hand of, father, of the Father. And as he was raised to the right hand of the Father, what did he do? He forgave all those who crucified him. He forgave all those that, that um, were, caused his suffering, just like Joseph did. Jesus suffered for you. I want you to hear that this morning, friends. He suffered for you. He faced adversity for you. And if you believe this, it'll turn you into someone who uses adversity in your life to serve others. You won't face adversity the same because if you realize that truth, that God meant it for good, it's going to change you, it's going to transform you, and it's going to help you move closer to God. And when you think about your plans not coming to fruition, your dreams not working out, you're no longer going to think, God doesn't love me. You'll be looking to do his will. You'll say, God, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because even though the world was meant for evil, the, the world meant it for evil, God meant it for good, the good of serving others. Joseph's story reminds us that by remembering our place, by remembering the big picture, by remembering our purpose, we can face adversity and potentially make the world a better place. Always remember, if somebody was in your circumstances, how would they respond if they were absolutely confident that God was with them? That's the fundamental question that will, in, in terms of how you respond to that, I hope you respond to that like Joseph did. But if you respond to that like Joseph did, you know what? It's going to change you. It's going to inspire others around you. And it's going to make the world a better place. Let's pray together. God, we come before you. We all have faced adversity in life. The challenge is how we respond to it. Do we react impulsively? Or do we respond thoughtfully in a way that is honoring to you, in a way that is consistent to what we believe about who you are? God, thanks for this example of Joseph, but thanks even more for the example of Jesus who suffered and faced adversity so that we could have a relationship with you. Thanks that he went to those lengths. He served us in that way. God, encourage us with that today and this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.